John chapter 2. We'll begin there where we left off last week. And then after that, we'll go to 2 Timothy chapter number 3. There's something that, uh, that I, uh, I want to just uh, reiterate again. So anytime we see anything in the word that um, could be considered negative, so to speak. You know, we live in a weird culture right now. How many of you have noticed that? I mean, you can't be negative. There's so much, uh, there's so many uh, culture police out there, you know. Um, I was listening to a uh, gentleman the other day share about uh, an encounter he had at the airport. He was a retired military man who had done uh, several tours overseas in Afghanistan, Iraq, and that area, and he had a service dog. And this dog had done the tours with him, and he actually shared pictures of this dog with like members of the Taliban and the dogs sitting next to them. Obviously, they were captured. So he's a military dog. I mean, he's a potentially a killer, right? And so he has a, a service dog vest. How many have seen those on the dog? And it says, do not pet. Uh, you know, it's a, it marks it as a service dog. Don't pet the dog. And this lady came up with a with a gentleman, and said uh, said uh, the lady said, "Do you mind if I pet your dog?" She asked, and he said, "Well, uh, I appreciate you asking." And since she asked, yeah, you can go ahead and pet the dog. And uh, so she pet the dog a little bit, and then the gentleman standing there with her said, "Is it okay if I pet the dog?" And he goes, "Well, I don't know if I would do that if I were you." He said, she, uh, she's a lot nicer with girls, with women, than she is men. And the guy got furious. How do you know I'm a guy? And went down this, this road, right? <laughs> so the military guy said, well, if you want to go ahead and pet her, you can. She'll decide whether you're a guy or a girl. That'll cure it. You know what I mean? You... <laughs> so, even though sometimes truth can be a little bit hard or it can feel like it is, it's necessary. Um, we, ha- we, we live in a world that is pushing towards no absolutes. There are no absolutes. Um, I gender, like the, the gender issue, I'm not going to go deep into this right now, but the idea is, is that it's whatever you feel. Well, if I followed everything I felt and wasn't taught truth, I mean, I'd be in prison. <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I literally would be in prison. I mean, if the world functioned and just, they just did and acted on everything they thought or came to their mind and everything that they felt, how many know it would be chaos? But there are generations of people that are being, uh, have been trained up and are being trained up that way. Now, there's always been rebellion, but if, I think if I had to peg some of the trouble that we're facing today, it started maybe in the late 50s and the 60s, some of the, I mean, it, it was before that too, because as a nation, America was founded on biblical principles. We, we had the founding fathers who pledged their lives and their treasures, their, their wealth, to establishing uh, what we know as America and giving their whole lives for a future for us to be able to live without even knowing, you know, in freedom. To, to ultimately not just own a gun, that's important, not just, uh, you know, be able to say whatever you want, I think. That's obviously important too. But ultimately, the main goal was we wanted to worship God freely. Um, Because the the, uh, country that we were, that people were enslaved to at that time that wanted out, the government and religion had become buddies. And whenever that happens, that's a bad thing. Unless, unless... And they become, you know, an elitist group, right? 
but they wanted to worship God. Now we live in a culture where people are willing to sell each other out for their money, to keep their money, and to be able to do what they want to do. So culture shifted. So what causes that to shift? It's always the spirit of Antichrist. Because the spirit of Christ will cause a person to give of what they have for the benefit of another at the expense of themselves. You know, Jesus, aren't you glad that, that his mantra was, you scratch my back, I'll scratch. Aren't you glad that wasn't his mantra? We'd still be lost. Because we, we could never reach the standard of purity that was necessary to be in relationship with him. Only he could reach that for us. And so when we look at some of these verses and we look at what's going on uh, and what, we're, what we've been talking about as far as out of 2 Timothy when we get there, and some of the things that are going to be that are going on and will continue to go on in in cycles in people, we realize that even from the from the sixties, the seventies, that area, all the way to where we are now, there are generations of atheism and ungodliness being seeded and sown, reaped, harvested, seeded, sown, reaped, harvested, and it just keeps going and going and going. And those that reject Christ, where there's really no change or a difference of heart being brought into their lives, what do they repeat and what do they seed into their kids? And then it multiplies in those kids. And then it, it gets sown into the next generation and it multiplies there, right? So we need to understand these things not only for the purpose of keeping them out of our own lives and out of our families, but then also for the purpose of understanding how to preach and share the gospel with those that are lost and then be able to assist them in walking away from the stuff that they're in, in living a life that is separated, consecrated to God. And what a, a term that was used to be more popular, but it got a bad name, uh, which eventually all doctrines try to get that are truly big, biblical. The enemy tries to push them a wrong direction. And get them overbearing. But living a holy life. Do you know holiness is not a cuss word? But in some churches, if you mention sin, people are like, you're going to condemn people. Well, we may convict them. But we're not going to condemn them. You're never going to win anybody to the Lord by just... By just presenting this idea that they're that everything's okay just the way they are and they never need to change i mean it's totally counter to the idea of being born again if nothing needs to change in me then why do i need to get born again so then after that you know sometimes we, we get um, a different denominations and things we'll get hung up on the idea of well you know, once you're born again, and you were born again by grace through faith, in other words, you didn't earn any of it. So you really shouldn't expect any change in anybody's life because it's by grace through faith. And the reason why they, they end up just kind of stopping there is because they don't understand grace. Well, I should say this. They understand half of grace. Because grace isn't just unearned, undeserved favor. Grace is the empowerment of God to live in righteousness. Grace is the empowerment of God to enslave the flesh to a lifestyle of righteousness. Where people got off then, though, is they thought, well, I'm earning my salvation by doing right, which is totally counter to grace on the front side. So people say, well, then why should we live right? Well, it's for your benefit. God gave us the principles of, and we live in this principle right now, of seed time and harvest. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh destruction. If you sow to the spirit, you'll reap from the spirit everlasting life or eternal life or the God kind of life. 
So I need to understand how the spirit of Antichrist operates in order that I may resist it, in order that I may keep it out of my life. Why? Because I don't want to yield to that and harvest something I don't want to. I don't want to yield to that and hinder the potential impact that God can have through my life as his garden, his, his uh, seed bed, through my life to be able to advance or promote or we could say manifest his kingdom here on earth. As a witness and as one who is an assistant to the rest of the body of Christ. So in other words, growing up spiritually is a big deal. Right? It's why you keep coming back for more. Because even as much as, I love what Mark says, it's, it's still one of my favorite quotes. He'll, he'll come up to me after some services and he'll say, you know, I couldn't duck fast enough. In other words, you feel like everything is hitting you between the eyes or you feel like the truth comes and it's like, wow, that's really tough. And then when truth comes, we have an opportunity. Spiritually mature people, and, this, and that's who I'm looking at. So not even one amen on that, you know. Here I am up here fighting this corded mic and I didn't even get one amen on that. <laughs> I so want to move right now, but I can't. I am stuck, Josh. I take authority over the soundboard demon in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to... Anyway, all right. <laughs> I have the opportunity when I hear truth to decide whether I'm going to let that truth into my life or not. If somebody comes to me and tells me truth... I can go, well, they didn't say it the way I like. Now, I'm not saying that's an excuse for the person who didn't say it the way they should. They should have said it right. But I can, I can look at that situation and go, well, they didn't say it right. So I'm not going to accept it. And then what happens? I miss out on freedom. Not because, and it is because I just didn't appreciate the package the gold came in. So how many have ordered uh, like gold or silver before or precious metals? A few hands. Good. More you should do it. Okay. It'd be good for you to have some. People, some people say, well, how am I going to do that? Save some money and buy it. Okay. <laughs> Would it? What if the gold or the silver didn't show up in the package that you thought should house that precious metal? What if it was a brown paper bag out on your front porch? And you just look at it and it's like, what? It doesn't even say Amazon. You know? And you walk by it for a few days and you never bother to open it. What do you miss? The treasure that's in there. So when I hear truth, I have an opportunity. I can go, well, you know, the preacher says that. Or if the preacher spoke this, who said this? If the word of God is being legitimately delivered and spoken, the written word of God, if, they're just, if scripture is just being read, do you realize that I can have an attitude toward that if I don't like maybe the delivery person or maybe the setting that we're in or what, there could be all sorts of things. I'm just in a bad mood today. I didn't eat what I was supposed to. You know, I, all of these things. And I can actually disrespect this. Not just the book in a, in a sense, but you're disrespecting the Lord. Imagine if Jesus was in front of you teaching this word. Well, where would the respect level go for the word if at your devotion time, Jesus sat down with you every time you had devotion and opened his book and said, okay, now here's what I want you to know. Boy, it just takes it to another level, doesn't it? But see, every time we approach this book, that's what we're doing. 
It's the Lord sitting down with us. Now, I have never seen the Lord open the book to me in the sense of like, you know, in an open vision type setting. I, have, I know people that have, you know, but it's never happened to me. But what if in the midst of that, in the midst of us looking to the word, we, we sat there and we went, you know, Lord, this is you talking to me. This is not just some random story. This is, the, this is the creator of the universe who saw fit to give me his words. Now, the wonderful thing about the Lord is, is he is there every time you open the book. Now, you don't, may not see him, but obviously what? The Holy Spirit lives where? Within you, right? So you have his spirit, his nature within you. So he, every time we look at this, we're listening and looking and reading from him. So when, when we come across maybe passages, we go, well, that's tough. Imagine Jesus talking to you about it. And then analyze yourself and go, am I going to listen to this right now? Am I going to take this in? for me right now be humble be open and yield to his word or am i going to go that doesn't really match my opinion because as christians we do this and the reason why is uh, there's a lot of reasons why but one of the main reasons is obviously we have the ability to think and we have the ability to choose so there's this reverence that we're supposed to have for the word of God. So when we have a heart that's correct, boring subjects turning into lightning quick. What people consider boring, what they consider, yeah, have you ever done this? Have you ever, I will raise my hand because I've done this. Have you ever sat down in a service, which I don't get to do much anymore. <laughs> I used to do it more. Have you ever sat down in a service and you went, and the, and the subject is presented that you're about to hear, and immediately you think, I've heard that before. You have now shut off any level of revelation that was going to come until you adjust that attitude. Not to mention that, you've also hindered the ability of whoever's ministering to be able to deliver certain things that the Lord may want to deliver. I've uh, had the privilege of obviously going to Ramah and listening to Brother Hagin um, and hear, hear him teach on faith. But there are other ministers there as well that, uh, that were very, just, just, they're just phenomenal ministries all over the world that came out of that ministry. And what I mean by that is that he was able to father them in the faith and, and, and mentor them in, in what they're doing. One of those people was Mark Hankins. And Mark Hankins would go to a camp meeting and winter Bible seminar every year. And he sat down, or he was sitting down waiting. He needed a word from God is kind of how he put it. And so Brother Hagin opened his Bible and said, all right, let's turn to Mark 11, 23 and 24. And if you know Brother Hagin, if you've listened to him, Kenneth Hagin Sr., if you've ever listened to him, he taught, people thought he wrote that verse. It wasn't him. But he preached it so much, and then he would have people come to him. When are you going to preach something else? He said, well, when you get this, I'll preach something else. Now, a lot of people can't even hear that. They'll just go, that arrogant preacher. And you'll never know what was supposed to be known with that kind of attitude. Right? I would never get it, right? If I, if I just, if, if I sat there and thought, well, I already know. I've already read that. I have that memorized. I can quote that. Then I end up shutting myself off to the ability of God to be able to show me something that I don't know. And so humility is a big deal. Well, Mark Hankins was sitting there, and he just had inside of himself, he just went, oh, Lord, I know this verse. And the Holy Spirit got in the middle of him. And he said, if you'll change your attitude, I'll show you something in that you've never seen before. He said, you came here for a word of God, and I gave the minister what he was supposed to teach. And now you're rejecting 
What is your answer? Uh, I heard Keith Moore say this, and these are just different ministers that have really ministered to me over the years, and um, you may not know who they are, but they're seasoned, well-known ministers, high character, and still going strong and growing and having impact in their ministries. But Keith Moore said this. He said there were times he went to preach at places, and he was there for four nights, and he couldn't get past the first message. He had prophetic things that God had given him specifically for those churches that he went to. And he could never get to them because the people just did not want to hear. They didn't want to go that direction. And people say, well, if, if, you know, if the Lord gave him a prophetic word, he should just give it. Nope. Why? Then you'll be accountable for something that you're never going to do. It's actually the mercy of God. It is. And I'm thankful for it, you know, because the Lord's patient with us. But it's that place of hearing that word and then assessing, looking at it, allowing it to sink into me, and then meditating there, going, Lord, what is it that you're wanting to show me here? Why do I need to know this? What was the purpose behind you canonizing things that these, that these men said? In other words, why did you maintain these writings out of all the things? Do you know how many times the Bible, through the, gener through the generations, has tried to be destroyed? Through book burnings and all sorts of things. Not being made available to the public. Some of the, some of the absolute uh, martyrdom that took place just to get the written word into what it was considered the common people. And in their common language. If you ever want to do a study on some amazing, miraculous stuff, go back and read how the Bible's been preserved through the years and through the generations. The enemy hates this word, which is a sure sign that we should love it and really allow it to speak to us and glean understanding out of it. And when we're in that place of respect, then it can speak to us like it's supposed to. So 1 John chapter 2, verse number 18 says this, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they, that they might uh, be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. So there's some really, uh, there's some truth here that's like, oh man, there's Antichrist out there? But then notice what it tails with, what it ends with in verse 20. Don't worry about it. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you what? You know all things. In other words, you know everything. The Holy Spirit will let you know everything you need to know in the midst of Antichrist spirit operating in the earth. The Antichrist spirit wants to destroy you. It wants to destroy your family. It wants to destroy your kids. It wants to destroy your finances. It wants to destroy everything. Ultimately, and, and this is the principle here, not only does the Antichrist spirit hate the Christ... But it desires to remove it because Satan desires to be God. So who's in his way? You. Can Satan trot up to heaven and give God a, a black eye? No, he tried this already. How did it turn out for him? Okay, he's out. There's no getting back in. All right? Um... And so the enemy hates God's children, and God still wants a family. So we're in this stage where the gospel is being preached, and there's a harvest coming in. There's a separation going on right now in the earth. It's called sheep and goats. One's on the right hand, one's on the left, right? Everybody knows you want to be on the right side. At least we do. Not on the left side, okay? And so... Um, we see here that this is what this Antichrist spirit does. Well, we need to understand what that Antichrist spirit is, how it operates, how it influences. 
The enemy influences through thoughts. He influences through thoughts that are conditioned or that are geared toward the desires of the flesh or the fallen nature. And he tries to cause uh, um, death in our lives, deception in our lives through his influence. But we have an anointing from the Holy One and know everything we need to know. So I'll put it to you like this. The anointing, when we, I'll put, I guess I wrote it down this way. So when we are looking at the problems that the Antichrist spirit is causing in the earth, we must also keep in mind that we have an anointing from the Holy One, and that anointing will instruct us in all wisdom and empower us for full victory in Christ Jesus. So don't allow the enemy to manipulate you with fear concerning what the Bible teaches. Some people... They do this. They go, well, I don't want to look at that because that puts fear in me. No, actually, the Bible can only put faith in you. If you're declaring that the word of God puts fear in you in an, I'm talking about demonic, satanic fear, you're wrong. It's impossible. God's word is not empowered with death. It's empowered with life, right? Right? So it can never put fear in us. So the so people say, well, then what's the issue? You have fear in you. If you're afraid to look at the word or you just don't want to hear that, that is an internal issue. And the word of God is actually showing it to you. And it also gives you the answer on how to get it out. Because the written word of God has power. It has power to renew. It has power to destroy. It has power to remove everything that is of the nature of the enemy. So when we look at the word of God, it would be impossible for the written word of God, the anointed word of God, to put a unholy fear, a demonic fear in, person, in people. It's impossible. God doesn't have any of that fear. He doesn't carry any of that fear. So we must resist fear and drive it out of our lives and realize that what is written is, is there to instruct us or to prepare us, not to scare us. We need to learn to identify in Scripture what the Lord has declared about us versus what he has declared for us. So in other words, the Scriptures not only teach your identity in Christ, but they also inform you of your enemy and his devices. The written word of God not only informs you of who you are in Christ, but it informs you of your enemy and his devices. What if you said, well, I just don't want to know about the enemy. I just don't want to know how he operates. Yet the scripture clearly teaches that we're not to be ignorant of his devices. How are you going to resist what you don't know? You know, this happens with, with children or people that are raised in twisted environments. They don't know that something is wrong because that's how it always was. So as a believer, I need to understand what my enemy, how he, how he operates, how he thinks, and what he does. And as I gain understanding concerning those things, what takes place? I actually have the ability to, like the scripture says, put on the full armor of God that you may be able to what? Stand against, right? Right? the enemy in the evil day. We understand his wiles, therefore we resist them and we drive him out. Truth is a wonderful thing. And it is a liberating thing. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, let's go there. Sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Not 2. It's to the left in your Bible. 2 Timothy chapter number 3, in verse number 2, we left off last week talking about lovers of money. And I'm going to read this, I'll just read uh, this, this first part of 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 and 2. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. And that word will come, that phrase will come, means you'll be surrounded by it. For men will be lovers of, se of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. This word or this phrase, lovers of money, means covetous. 
The phrase, the phrase or word depicts an inordinate love of money. How many have watched uh, Scrooge? That's an inordinate love of money until he got saved at the end. <laughs> That's true. How about bitterness? Can you think of any movies that, uh, that have bitterness in them? How about The Grinch? You ever watch The Grinch? Remember when he gets born again? His heart changes. If you watch the beginning of it, they're singing Christmas carols. They're singing about Christ at the beginning. All right. Maybe I pay too much attention. I'm going to get a sermon out of anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Love of money is an inordinate love of money and a, an abnormal preoccupation with money. You ever watch those guys that are trying to sell you their investment thing? Like the high energy guys, you know? I'll make you, and all they think about is money all the time. They're going to die. And then where is all, what good is their money going to do? I have not, I have not seen one person buy themselves into eternal life yet. And you guys know that I'm not against us prospering, but we cannot covet natural things. What does the world do? The world says, when I get this house, when I get this many cars, when I have this money in my retirement, then I'll be happy. When I finally work my days and I can retire and then I can go do what I want to do, then I'll be, why not just be happy now? Why not just love Jesus now? And give your whole life to him and see where you end up at the end and see if he isn't a better manager of my things than I am. And follow his leading, amen? So this idea is covetousness. It's an unhealthy thing. It's a crazy like, I gotta have more thing. And I read all these different things to you uh, last week that I'm not gonna go through. But I wanna just share some questions with you that I think every believer and every person, whether they're a believer or not, maybe you're watching online, but if you're a believer or not, you should ask yourself these questions. What do I give financially into the work of God's kingdom? I love these questions. What do I give financially into the work of God's kingdom? See, serious believers analyze their life. And serious believers, believers that are disciples, we don't just bump along in life going, well, you know, the Lord, if we hit it, we hit it. If we don't, we don't. Serious believers are the Proverbs 3 believers. They are those who what? Who acknowledge the Lord in every decision. What does James say? I posted this a while back on Facebook. But James says this. Don't say, I'm going to go to such and such a town and do business and make money. He says, you don't even know what tomorrow holds. And he's not saying don't make money. He's saying, don't you think you should acknowledge your God first before you do anything? Do you see that? And that's what this is. That's what the difference is. A lot of people won't even analyze this. They don't even have goals for their finances. You say, what do you mean? You mean giving goals? Yeah, I have a giving. Heidi and I have giving goals. Do you know why I have a giving goal? Because I believe God is increasing me for kingdom work. A lot of people, and I even did this, especially, especially at the beginning of my walk with the Lord, because you're maturing, you're trying to figure these things out, you just don't know a lot yet. And the more knowledge you gain, knowledge is great as long as you put it to work. Otherwise, it'll just make you spiritually chubby. Come on, have you ever seen the spiritually chubby Christian? They've been saved for 40 years and they're still embittered about what the coffee tastes like when they come in. They're just chubby. They're just squishy. They're soft. They have no lean mass to them. <laughs> uh, we got to hit these things and laugh a little bit. I, have go I, I, I believe that the, by the time I'm done, there is a goal that we have in mind that we want to be giving and that we want to be able to 
hand off to the next generation, so to speak. But I don't covet money. Do you know how I know I don't covet money? Because I give it away. And I don't go like this. Lord, the Lord told me, Mike, to give you this. <laughs> it's my favorite one. But I know if I'm going to grow, none of that. <laughs> I've shared this before, but I'll share it again. Um, it, just to, just as, a, as, a, as a continued challenge to these things. I know uh, years ago, uh, we, we had some money that we... that, that uh, that we had kind of stockpiled up, so to speak, through some different things that, that the Lord had blessed us with. And uh, we did not manage it well at all. And uh, I lost probably, I could have had over $100,000 of harvest out of investment with that money. And I just totally acted like an idiot and lost it all. Almost all of it. I think we had $9,000 left, right? Something like that. Heidi's like, I don't want to remember. Just move on. But I have to teach the people through our mistakes. <laughs> Don't be stupid like I was. Okay? So I knew I couldn't, I wasn't going to save back that money. So you know what I did? I sowed nine $1,000 seeds. Because I knew the devil couldn't get it. I knew it was getting out of his hands and I wasn't, it was putting it into the ground, into the, it was, I was operating in faith because I knew I could not recuperate myself. I couldn't get it back on my own. And it was a, it was a, it was not a desperate move, but it was a calculated move in that sense. So what did I know? If I love the money, what would I do? This is all I got left. This is it. If I, if I have to, now I'm not telling you to be irresponsible with your money. So you, again, these are things you have to ask yourself the question and talk to God for yourself. Amen. All right. So second question, what do, what do my spending habits reveal about me? Like some of you may need to quit ordering pizza and learn how to cook at home. Some of you need to go out for pizza every once in a while and just realize you got enough, so you'll be fine. <laughs> but see, you can't complain about not having money at the end of the month if you spent outside the budget money that you have. Yay. All right. We're not covetous, right? Some people are like, I need overcoming pizza faith. <laughs> Well, keep feeding on the word, and pepperoni won't control you anymore. Uh, yeah, all right. What do I do with my time? What do I do with my time? I know some people that, that, uh, that uh, they just don't want to work the hours that they, they need to. Through the years, I've known that. They're capable I'm not talking about a legitimate situation where somebody isn't capable. But how many realize we live in a generation today where we have all sorts of excuses why we can't do anything? And it's bad. It's bad. You know, if you're, if you're out of your parents' home, they shouldn't be supplying stuff for you all the time. Amen. Amen. You say, why is it? Now, I did this on purpose. Heidi and I did this. These are things we've proven, okay, through the years. We haven't done it perfectly, but we've purposed to do it. And then the Lord helps us come to this place of fullness. But we would purpose not to ask for money. I have faith, right? Believe your God. Not running, shouting stuff, but it's true nonetheless, Right? Believe God, you have faith, right? You have, a, you have a God who is El Shaddai, right? You can believe God. You can ask God and he can move and provide for you whether you get paid minimum wage or you get paid more than that or less than that. God is your provider, not necessarily just your job. Right? 
You can believe God. Now, I know there are times people get in situations where they need help. Totally get it. But if you're perpetually in need of help, something's not right. You got to grow. You got to develop. Amen? You believe, use your faith. Believe your God for more. He's a supply. All right. What do I do to serve others? I love this. You say, what are you talking about? Lovers of selves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, right? When I pray, do I pray for myself only or do I pray for the needs and dreams of others as well? That's so good. What personal sacrifices do I make to serve the Lord? What am I sacrificing to be obedient to God? And a lot of times people think, well, I, don't, I shouldn't have to sacrifice anything. It's biblical to sacrifice. It is biblical to prefer your brother above yourself. I know when I was down at Rama, you would have this. You'd have people, they would need help in an area in the ministry, but nobody wanted to skip the service with the special speaker, so they wouldn't help in the other area. Even though they easily could, but they thought, well, I want to be in the service. Well, you could take a step up, serve in an area, put yourself aside, and sow into someone else. What do I know about my relationship with the Lord when I can actually, when I can put myself in a position where I'm serving someone else, maybe I didn't prefer that, but I'm preferring my brother and sister above me. What do I know? I know I'm growing in faith. I know I'm maturing in the Lord. I know that I'm not yielded to the spirit of Antichrist that operates in the world. What am I sacrificing to be obedient to God. So these are some areas, and there are sub-questions to all those, and I didn't even give them, because I think that's probably enough. What's the second word here? Boasters. Or the third word, I think it is, boasters. So lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and boasters. What are boasters? This is a person who is an empty pretender. It carries the idea of a wanderer. I like that definition. The word boastful refers to one who brags and boasts about their accomplishments. And in their boasting, they overpass the limits of truth. I love that phrase, overpass the limits of truth. And they stress the fact, uh, they stre- uh, which stresses or they stress the facts to magnify themselves in an attempt to impress. This is what Rick Renner said about this word. This word carries the idea of one who is so committed to their own self-promotion and personal agenda that they are willing to exaggerate, overstate the facts, stretch the truth, embellish a story, and even lie if it will have a positive effect on their position or situation. Today, we would call this an example of situational ethics. Situational ethics. This is in the world. How many have noticed this? This is in the church too, unfortunately, but it's in the world. That is the hurling, situational ethics is the hurling away of fixed ethics or moral absolutes to embrace a floating ethics. How many know floating ethics shouldn't be tied together? Floating ethics, that's like saying, I have an anchor, but it goes wherever I go. Is it an anchor then? What is an anchor supposed to do? Hold you in one spot. If I have a floating anchor, we're in a storm and I throw you a life, you know, one of those life-saving, what are they, it's not a preserver, is it? What is it? Yeah, whatever it is. Anyway, and I throw you that and say, hey, throw this overboard. It'll keep us from floating around. What? You need to look at me and say, hey, dummy, that's not an anchor. No, no, here's my anchor. This is what a boaster is. They have ethics that move with whoever they're around. What do I know? If my faith fluctuates and my Christian witness and my ethics and my character fluctuate depending on whom I'm, who I'm around, something's not right. That's the spirit of Antichrist operating. So it's floating eth- ethics. It's a mode that, is e- that easily adapts to whatever one deems necessary. 
A good example of this would be politicians who change their ethics and policies to fit whatever the populace wants to hear them say. A person with this mindset will nearly do or say whatever is needed to further a personal agenda, if even if it clashed with conscience, conviction, or truth. Today we are witnesses of a society that has gone morally adrift and is regretfully being led by boasters. How many know we got boasters everywhere? Their beliefs, in other words, these leaders hold views that continually float, fluctuate, and shift. Their beliefs are affected by the ever-changing current of thought and by the most recently accepted norms, whatever they may be. There is a great description of lawlessness that is found in uh, Rick Renner's book, um, Last Day's Survival Guide, and uh, it talks about this very principle in there, that basically I become whatever you want as long as it gets me what I want, which means if I become what you want... In order to get what I want, you will never get what you voted for. Do you see that? That's a boaster. We don't want to be that person. We don't want to be that person. Can you handle one more? One more, it's short. Proud. (laughs) Pride. Such a good one. Pride, it means appearing above others or haughty. It carries the idea of an unrestrained estimation of one's means or merit, despising others or even treating them with contempt. This represents a person who sees themselves as above the rest of the crowd. This represents an arrogant, haughty, impudent, snooty, high and mighty, insolent attitude possessed by people who believe they are intellectually advantaged and therefore possess the right to, um, to uh, basically uh, uh, to force their agenda on everyone else. What an accurate description of those who would like to force their liberal agenda on the rest of us. This is especially accurate and seen in the media the political world, and the courts, in which many snootily, I like that word, snootily vaunt themselves as the vanguards of society. These leaders see themselves as a more sophisticated set of people than the rest of us, touting themselves as the rightful agenda setters for society, culture, and the world. Uh, Rick Renner goes on to say this, forgive me for being so blunt, But it seems that uh, visibility in front of the world has gone to the heads of these liberal influencers. As a result, they are abusing their trusted positions to force their own liberal and progressive views and agendas on the rest of us. From their public platforms in the media and in Hollywood, their podiums in the courtrooms, and their lecterns of university classrooms, they haughtily mock, sneer, disdain, disparage, and scorn people they deem relics of the past who stay true in their biblical convictions. These agenda setters see anyone who holds fast to the past moral codes and beliefs as a hindrance to the new world they want to create. And in truth, that is the case. We are a hindrance. We who refuse to budge from our biblical, our Bible-based convictions are part of the restraining force Paul referred to in 2 Thessalonians 2, 6, and 7. As we hold our stance of faith and shine the light of the Bible into a darkened world, we are forestalling or foretelling the onslaught of, or we're forestalling, sorry, the onslaught of evil that will eventually be released in society in full force. So in 2 Timothy 3, 2, in uh, Rick Renner's uh, description of that verse, he says this concerning the, the phrases that we've looked at up until this point. Men will be self-focused, self-centered, self-absorbed, self-consumed, and in love with themselves more than anyone else. 
As a result of this self-love, they will be driven to obtain more and more and more. These boasters are so committed to their, their one agenda that they are willing to exaggerate, overstate the facts, stretch the truth, embellish a story, and even lie if it will get them the position, advantage, or goal they desire. They are arrogant, haughty, impudent, snooty, and insolent. So what is all that stuff? That is all stuff we do not want to participate with. But realize that this is going on in the earth. But what do we have? We have an anointing from the Holy One. If I want to be a light in the midst of this kind of darkness, then I need to stick to this. I need to walk in this truth. I don't want to do anything that what? That would cause me to, to, to be in partnership or live in partnership with a spirit of Antichrist. I want to live with the spirit of Christ. I'm all for, and we, will, and we will continue to see and have miracles, signs, and wonders. But guys, I will say this. Our walk in reverence and fear and in the fear and the awe of God is just as much a witness as our miracles, signs, and wonders. Our love for one another in the body of Christ is as big, if not bigger, a witness to the rest of the world as the signs, wonders, and miracles and all the other things that we love as believers and the graces that we appreciate and are so grateful for that the Lord has given to us. Our character is a big deal. If you're a business owner, don't lie. Don't lie about your business. Don't pretend. If you work for somebody, you're an employee, don't steal from them. Don't work really hard when, they're, when the boss is around and then lays off when they're gone. The Lord is still there. Amen. Don't get arrogant. Don't, don't, uh, uh, here's one for you. You're a business owner. You're a contractor. Don't down and talk bad about the other contractors to try to make yourself look good so maybe you'll get the job. I'm talking about if you're a believer. Why do you need to do that if the favor of God is on your life? You're a giver, right? You're a blessed person, right? If you're up for promotion and you're being interviewed along with others, don't promote yourself. You know what I mean by that? You can share what you bring to the table, but don't down somebody else and, pre and, and, and present some sort of false reality concerning yourself. I actually uh, uh, came up against some of this years ago when I was down in Tulsa. I had a gentleman, and this was the time I did it right. But I had a gentleman uh, and a lady that I would, actually there were about four or five people going for two positions. One of the people that was being interviewed had a college degree and everybody pretty much knew that, and it was kind of in this area, that they were going to get the job. But the others were up for grabs. And you know what's interesting? I went in for my interview and, and the, the lady who was interviewing me said, we're going to hire you. And she said, part of the reason why is because one of the other people interviewing for the position said, if I was going to hire anybody, I would hire Sean. Now that's the favor of God. I mean, how do you do that? Well, there's a way. If we walk in our integrity in the spirit, we don't follow the course of the world, and we function in that integrity. In other words, guys, I love Faith Family Church. I want everybody to come here. But it's, it, but, and I want you, I mean, I want all your friends to come and all your enemies. Because that way you'll have an opportunity to walk in love. Praise the Lord. <laughs> All right, we'll all grow together, but it will do us no good to attack others. I'm just going to say this. It'll bless somebody. It'll probably make somebody mad too. <laughs> no, it probably won't. I've had people send me videos of, not, not here, okay, not here. All right, not here at all. But I've had people from other churches, other people's churches, 
other pastors in the city, send me videos of their pastor asking me what I thought of what they preached. Don't do that. Figure it out on your own. If you're in that church and you just can't get on the ball with it, don't be a thorn in the flesh. You know what I mean? I had somebody tell me recently, I was talking to him on the phone and, and uh, just checking in on him because I hadn't seen him in a while. And they said, oh yeah, I've decided to go this route. I'm not going to, I'm no longer, I, don't, I just don't agree with, you know, basically what we preach. And they told me what church they were going to. You know, I have a lot of thoughts that go through my head. But I don't say them. I've learned not to. And I could argue, but you know what? I said, Godspeed, bless you. If you have a family, go with it. I just let them go. Why? What good is it going to do for me to badmouth the place they're going? I mean, unless it's absolutely, you know, a cult, obviously then I'll say something. But, it, but most of the time it's not. Most of the time they're good places. Are they going to teach things I disagree with? Well, sure. I mean, I've taught things myself that I disagree with myself on. Later. <laughs> I know, it's disappointing, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, you get the point. We're resisting the spirit of the age. We're walking in integrity. We're not self-lovers. We don't, we don't worship money. We're not proud and boastful. We're, we're looking at ourselves going, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to give? How do you want me to serve? How can I be a blessing to somebody? It's not all about me. How can I pray for this person or that situation? What changes can I make, Lord, that would please you and keep me out of this world system and functioning within your systems? Father, we just thank you so much for your word, and we thank you for your goodness. Father, we thank you that you're helping us grow and teaching us, and that we commit, Lord, to be doers of your word and not hearers only. In Jesus' name, amen.